Well, hello everyone. Um, I guess what I'm going to talk to you today about is programmability. And so, first of all, let's have a look at where I'm going to go with this. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of background information about myself, my company, and the project that we're uh, working on at the moment, LPGPU. And then, before we look at the uh, tool we've developed for profiling the memory accesses in this um, system, I'll introduce a single source heterogeneous language that we've developed, which is kind of builds on some technology we've been working on for quite some uh, years called Offload, which extends C++ in a few interesting ways. So the tool that we'll end up looking at will um, help uh, the developer who uses um, languages like this, where you've got a kind of single source solution to parallelism and possibly multiple address spaces in your programming model. And then we'll apply it to a case study involving interactive uh, inverse kinematics animation. So here's some details about ourselves for uh, a compiler optimization and language development company. We're about 25 of us at the moment, full time, based in Edinburgh since 1999. And we focus on GPU and heterogeneous architectures. Um, although increasingly that's become mobile and embedded CPU, GPU system on chips. Um, so I guess we kind of came into this round about the time of the PlayStation 2 when we did a, a compiler that provided us a single source approach to PlayStation 2 development rather than the use of two compilers that you might normally have used for the SPU and the, uh, well at the time it was um, different but the, the two different processors. Um, so yeah we've got a few commercial partners and a few others we can't list. Um, we're involved in two um, EU Framework 7 research projects, PEFR, which has just come to an end, and LPGPU, which is about halfway through. Um, as I said, we're a Sony licensed PS3 for the moment, middleware provider, and we're a contributing member of the Kronos group. Um, within the Kronos group, there's um, the OpenCL HLM subgroup, um, of which our CEO is the chair. Um, we're also a member of the HSA Foundation. Um, and the HSA System Runtime Working Group is also chaired by our CEO, Andrew Richards. So we're working on uh, a project now for about one and a half years, um, low power GPU, LPGPU, and uh, this involves research into low power and mobile GPU technology. Um, there are six consortium members um, from academia and industry. So there's four companies um, and two universities involved in this work. And you can read more about the uh, research we're doing at lpgpu.org. Um, my own company, Codeplay, they, we come in at the tools level. Uh, we, we class compilers as tools in general, and so that's where we are. Distinct address spaces is something we have had to deal with for quite a few years and, and probably still will. Um, so this, this is a image is probably quite common to anyone who's developed for GPUs. Um, in OpenCL there are four address spaces, private, local, constant and global. In that diagram I guess you can see that the registers there would correspond to private memory in OpenCL. Shared memory corresponds to local from OpenCL. Um, global is, is represented there, available to all threads that are launched on the GPU. I uh, don't think constant's shown in this, but it's four um, statically verified separate address spaces that are um, used within the OpenCLC um, programming language. In a sense, there were two address spaces in, for a developer of the PlayStation 3, and our um, single source solution to development there uh, did expose it uh, using that abstraction of two address spaces for the main memory and the local store. And we'll have a look at that shortly in our language. Sometimes these are called addressable caches, and in a sense, that's uh, uh, quite an intuitive way to consider them. Locality <coughs> seems to be something that one way or the other uh, is here to stay, um, whether it's uh, in, in some sense handled by the hardware within the HSA or not. Um, it may be that even a system like HSA um, will, a, a developer looking for performance may well still want to reveal the actual um, memory address spaces underneath the abstraction or not. 
Perhaps in Betty C should have been at the start, actually, but uh, for quite some years it's been uh, a language which has had multiple address spaces um, defined within it. Um, single source GPU programming, in a sense, just adds one address, uh, one more address space to those um, address spaces that you might already be handling. Um, and um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few to choose from nowadays with uh, C++ AMP, CUDA, our own offload C++, or the upcoming OpenCL HLM, which uh, should perhaps come out at the end of this year. Um, you can also choose Pragma-based solutions, um, so OpenMP, OpenACC, OpenHMPP, or um, Barcelona Supercomputing's SMP uh, Superscaler for Pragma-based compiler integrated solutions. Um, so these have become quite popular. I guess they facilitate a rapid porting of existing software, and they can allow serial and parallel codes to coexist, which can help with debugging and initial development. Um, and often these uh, solutions come as part of an integrated package or IDE. You might get additional tools when you um, use these software. So one way or the other, they've, they've, they're kind of pushed uh, in recent times. Yeah, I mean, for education, they're quite good for training. The, the, the examples can typically fit on one slide, etc. So here's, um, I guess, the whole <coughs> introduction to our own offload C++ API for the PlayStation 3. Um, here we've got a basic block which makes a function call, but we can um, add to this with the, the keyword offload beforehand, and that will cause a blocking um, asynchronous thread to launch on the accelerator of the system that you're targeting. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. It says offload. Yeah, I think I've chosen the wrong uh, color for the keywords. They're all going to be that shade of blue, I'm afraid. So uh, the functions that are um, within the dynamic scope of the offload block will all be automatically compiled for both the host and for the accelerator. And that was a blocking launch, so for uh, a non-blocking um, launch of that thread, you would first of all capture the, uh, the thread ID, and then um, at some point later in the program, you would join the threads with offload thread join. And asynchronous calls may also join out with the function scope where they were launched. Um, Apologies for the colour again. I've got some keywords here, void, double, um, and the offload keyword down here again. The, the functions that are called within the dynamic scope of the offload block are automatically duplicated for the architecture that you're targeting, the parallel architecture. So the entire function call graph is duplicated, implicitly rooted by each call, um, the offload block. There's a second um, extension to the C++ language that we've introduced here. Um, so first of all, you've got a simple way to launch a thread. And if you want to launch more than one thread, you just put them within a for loop. But we've also extended the, uh, the type system of C++ um, with multiple address spaces. And so for the offload PS3 version, we've got two address spaces. So now each pointer within our system is implicitly assigned a locality which is um, defined statically within the system. And to dereference a pointer will implicitly move the data between uh, the different memory banks of the accelerator that you're targeting. And one of the advantages we get by targeting the C++ system is that we can make use of template metaprogramming and type traits to um, kind of add a, a certain layer of genericity to the, the programming system. So now an example using the, uh, the different memory spaces. So here I've um, got another offload block, and within it I've declared a, a, a double variable, which is now stored within the local memory of the accelerator. If I now declare an inner double pointer to this, um, it will it will be an inner pointer as opposed to an outer pointer. But this is, um, 
this pointer attribute can actually be inferred from its initialization there. And so we can uh, omit that um, declaration. Within um, an offload block, you can also um, target uh, data which is declared outside of the offload block, and that will implicitly be outer as opposed to inner um, pointer type. And there are the, the outer keywords used, but again, it's optional, and so it can be dropped. And this example just takes the, the idea further and just uses it to add one to the, <coughs> the data that's uh, stored in the data variable, which is in the outer memory scope. We can also overload on the pointer's locality as well. So within this function here, F4, we have another offload block. We've declared um, data local to this uh, offload block. We can then call a function we've defined here, uh, reverse copy, uh, much like the STL function. We've not uh, had to add any annotation to whether it's using inner or outer uh, pointer types. We just make a call to reverse copy, which we've defined, and it works. And it would work outside of the scope of the offload block as well. But we can also specialize as well if we had a particular uh, version that would be optimized. We could define um, by overloading and adding specific uh, type annotations. We can, like the previous one was implicitly so, so that the first um, argument was um, outer. The first and second arguments were outer, but we were targeting uh, the reverse result to end up in some memory which is local to the offload block and so implicitly this becomes outer, outer, inner and I've made that explicit there with uh, this declaration, reverse copy which has got an outer double pointer, another outer double pointer and then an inner double pointer but we can actually bring the data back to where it began uh, this time we work on rev data and rev data which is declared local to the offload block and then we can uh, write out the data to the uh, memory which is um, outside of the offload block, which is of an outer locality. Um, and so this would all have worked implicitly anyway, but if you happen to have uh, an optimized version, you can actually use this as a, an additional um, overload vector in your C++. So now we can have two different versions of reverse copy if that suits us. Um, just a, a quick slide on alternatives in, in um, C++ AMP, for example, you have to mark every um, function that will be called on, <coughs> on your accelerator um, with CPU or uh, AMP for running on the GPU. Um, the, the issue with this is that every function within a library that you might use, for example, you might decide to use Boost for your, um, your GPU programming, but you would need to make sure that every function uh, within there, as well as, of course, following the restrictions that typically attend any GPU language, you would also have to make sure that every uh, function call was marked with restrict uh, CPU or GPU. So what we find is we can actually port this code fairly quickly. So if you have a, a, a non-parallel piece of code and you'd like it to run quickly on your accelerated system, you can quickly do this using uh, a solution like our own or perhaps like uh, a competitor or uh, your, your own. Um, for example, we did this with NASCAR The Game 2011 for the PlayStation 3. The, the thing that you next want to do now that you've, you've got your code to run quickly is to optimize and uh, get the performance up to where it should be because you may well have, the, have it that uh, the code now runs slower than, than it was. <laughs> Taking into account um, energy for a second again, um, essentially fetching operands costs more energy than computing on them. If you're doing a GPU calculation where you have to copy across from the main memory before you do your calculation. So moving a, a word across a die might cost 10 fuse multiply adds in terms of power. 
um, but moving a word off chip would be 20 fuse multiply adds. So, especially with our system and, and systems like it, what you next want to do is to look under the hood, essentially, and find that all those implicit um, movements of data between different memory spaces, which are now abstracted away for you, you now want to dig a little bit deeper and understand where they're happening. Yeah, and I, I kind of motivate it with the, uh, the code excerpt at the bottom. I hope you can read that, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's just basic C++, but in our system, you wouldn't know uh, where that particular, um, where the location of P2 and the location of P1 were. So we're dereferencing P2, copying its data into uh, the address of P1, but we've abstracted away from that, so you don't know uh, if that's incurring an expensive DMA transfer or not. So we've created a tool uh, for the LPGPU project. It provides a simple C API interface for uh, the user of our um, offload C++ technology. Initially, we've developed it for uh, the offload C++ and PS3, which is our more mature uh, compiler technology. Um, there's quite a lot of data that we actually log throughout this, this uh, tool's uh, execution. It's around about 10 megabytes per kernel thread. And we log uh, data such as that listed uh, below. Um, the access type, the element data type, the amount of data, its location in terms of original file, um, the frequency of, of that transfer within the control path of the program, and alignment, if that's useful, such as a uh, whether it's aligned to a four-byte boundary or so. After you've um, added the, uh, the, the, C, the C API to your call, you can then visualize within Visual Studio um, after you've, you've run it one time to collect the data. And so with the two-dimensional graph, you might see along the x-axis that that's the, um, the memory operations ordered by time. And on the y-axis, that is the, uh, the memory address uh, on the host system. And each of these different colors corresponds either to a, a, a copy, a read, or a write. Um, but it might also be additional details that uh, we can reveal through our compiler, such as whether or not the data was aligned or not, um, and so on. This is an example using four threads. So for the, the PS3, typically we're, we're aiming for about five threads or six threads, perhaps. But um, here you can drag and drop this. And uh, if, you, if you click any one of those uh, bars, that corresponds to a memory transfer. And in, in, a, in, a, in a way similar to when you, you would look at whether or not you were getting ha cash hits or cash misses, this will let you see where the, the DMA transfers occur. And if you click any one of those, it highlights the line of source code which issued the DMA transfer, which is on the right-hand side. And uh, yeah, now the z-axis is all the threads. And uh, here's a, a closer look at each of those sections. Um, yeah. So we applied this to Um, some code from one of our partners in LPGPU, um, AI Game Dev, and they've got an animation system. And so we first of all ported it to offload PS3, and we intended to make it run in parallel across all the SPUs of the, the PlayStation 3. So we then uh, analyzed it using our memory access profiler and tried to improve the power consumption and the performance of the program overall. Um, So this gives a basic overview of the task that we intended to parallelize here. Um, so it's a closed form, two bone, inverse kinematics algorithm. And we're basically performing leg cycles and hand aiming in an interactive uh, application. You can see a screenshot of it here in the bottom right. And uh, there's a separate animation component for each actor. So through our tool, we were able to iterate the performance improvement quite nicely. Um, I'm going to uh, look in a little bit more closely at each of these graphs over the next few slides.
but we begin with something like this, which is probably quite hard to see, but it's, it's almost random access, really. I mean, this, this code was just um, animation code. It wasn't data parallel code. It wasn't intended for, to run in parallel. So initially, it comes in like this, and we can get it to run quite quickly on our um, offload C++ system. Um, so it's completely fragmented uh, accesses and runs quite slowly. So the next thing we were able to do um, was to uh, change it to the middle graph where we've got multiple accesses now to contiguous structures. And then finally, uh, single accesses to contiguous structures using uh, functions such as memcopy. And this considerably improved the performance. We got about a 7.5 times performance improvement for the animation component. And that's a closer look. So as you can see, quite fragmented. Um, by clicking on each of those, you're able to see the line of code where this originated. Um, this is something we think will be useful in general for single source language solutions like this. Now multiple contiguous accesses and then two large accesses for this particular piece of code. There's a software cache as well in our system that we use. Uh, you can also visualize that. In a sense, that's sort of connecting with a more traditional tool. So here, um, we've got the offload block again. Um, we're accessing an outer uh, location, X. Um, so we start off with, we run through a loop, and we would like to see that the, the data is cached. And um, so we do see it. So the, the first time we do a cache read, and we get a cache miss on the first loop. And you can see that is the pink block on the right. Um, and then we do a write, and we get a, a, a write hit from the cache. And then from then on, as we iterate and do a, a read and then a write for each of the, the steps in, in the loop, we see what we would hope for, um, cache hits and cache, uh, sorry, cache write hits and cache read hits all the way. Um, this is our API, by the way, it's quite lightweight. You can name your kernel as well, which is quite useful, but basically you enable and disable the profiling. Um, Here's an example which just helps you to see what the cache line size would be for your system. So um, it's, well, this example coincidentally uses the number 128, but actually it reveals that your cache size is 128 bytes. Um, the scale's too small here, but you'll see a cache miss where the arrows are, which is every 128 bytes um, as you traverse over this array. And so, my conclusion would be that we can expect to see further language integration of systems that use multiple address spaces and improved abstractions, which fits in a little bit with what Simon was talking about with the HSA architecture. It will still be useful to be able to dig a little bit deeper and to find out whether the system you're actually dealing with has got um, still perhaps separate uh, memory banks or whether there is uh, a full unification in the system. So for optimization purposes, that might be something you want to do. And basically, we hope that a tool such as ours can help to improve the performance of codes that were otherwise developed quickly, but perhaps with performance that needs a little bit more of a push. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much.